Sound Cellar Studio presents The Divine Daughter A Naming Ceremony Written and Narrated by Andrew Gilchrist Forward What do you do if you find yourself in a maelstrom in the middle of the sea? Imagine the current of a social media account. Imagine the flow of a television nightly news report. Stories crowd into the spaces, breaking against the constant movement of the news ticker. Advertising pop-ups compete with the anchor's steady presence and the babble of talking heads, all taking your attention. The swirl of text, image, and sound creates a feeling of total immersion in the information. Did the lead story just touch the surface or dive toward a story's undertow? How far down will the information take us? What you see from a screen of new information is not always the same as what you hear from that same information. As a result, the normal attitude toward writing, distant, watchful, analytical, may fail to find a remedy for the nausea of novelty. The point of this book is not to get you to follow the logic of the writer. Instead, prepare for exploration and association. Ride before breaking. Survive while surfing. When the time comes, when the rhythm and the sounds of the text draw upon your senses, position your board to see where your ride takes you. The scope of topics covered in this book is deliberately wide, deep, and tall. I wanted to look at literature, art, religion, and psychology, and ended up with an arrangement of ideas. A song can call your attention back to what's important. I have no intention of making metaphysical claims. I have no intention of making theological claims. I found these heuristics scattered on the shore like leaves under a great tree. They might come in handy, riding out the next squall. Unfortunately, surfers don't get to ride every wave. I apologize for not saying everything. Introduction. Signs, spirits, and the symbolic. Alas, where is the guide, that fond virgin, Ariadne, to supply the simple clue that will give us courage to face the Minotaur, and the means then to find our way to freedom when the monster has been met and slain? Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces. The power of a god was the power to know when to change your mind. Agamemnon and Jephthah. I invited two men to join you as you read this book. Imagine them standing or walking beside you, one on your left, one on your right. Some readers may consider them not real, while others may take them to be historical or even authoritative figures. They come as symbolic reminders, invoked spirits from the dawn of what I will refer to as the West. A phrase like the West can appear vague, but I want to use it as a quick abstraction an explanatory fiction, to start this conversation with you. By one shoulder is Agamemnon Atreides, a king of ancient Greece. He was bold and confident, a clever leader. His ambitions led him to sacrifice his daughter, Iphigenia. His warriors had enraged the goddess Artemis. Agamemnon calculated the sacrifice would win him favorable sea winds so that he could sail to conquer the prized city of Troy. He drove his Achaeans to victory over the walled city of King Priam, and then claimed the king's daughter Cassandra as a prize of war. When he returned home, mighty Agamemnon died at the hands of his wife, Clytemnestra, and her lover. His own son and daughter, Orestes and Electra, then killed his two murderers. An entire family fell into war against itself because of Agamemnon's choices. Afterwards, the children of this king among men stood before a court of gods, humans, and forces of nature in judgment for what they had done and what had become of the family. By your other shoulder is Jephthah. He was the bastard son of Gilead, hated by other sons in the family. Jephthah became a fearless leader of men, known for his strength and pride. Before one battle, Jephthah made an oath. He would make a sacrifice if he achieved a victory. 
He said he would give to God whatsoever first came out of his home to greet him after he claimed victory. Jephthah won the battle and returned home. His daughter ran out to meet him, making Jephthah weep in realization. Was this the price of his vow to God? He ripped his clothes and pulled his hair, but his only child gave herself to God with the consent of a willing sacrifice. Jephthah could have searched for help outside the authority of his own thoughts, but instead he remained faithful to his pride and his word. The experience changed the man, according to the story. He measured his oaths differently, knowing the true costs involved. Jephthah left a legacy as a mighty judge of Israel, but by the end of his story he became a broken man. Pieces of his body were scattered and buried, left behind in the cities of Gilead. Daughters of Israel spent four days each year lamenting the daughter of Jephthah and remembering her father's attempt to exercise control over a divine power. The sacrifices of these two men are hard to understand today. What hubris would drive people to think they must destroy the lives of their daughters and plummet generations of their families into chaos? What ambitions could be so compelling as to trade a daughter for fair weather or a child for a single victory on a battlefield? What is the value of such a prize if it comes at such a price? The stories of Agamemnon and Jephthah sound so distant and alien to many of us now. Yet in our globally connected world, the West has sent soldiers of war and representatives of peace over practically every sea to fight for whatever the West is supposed to stand for. Soldiers have followed orders from officers much like these two men and faced other individuals just as strong-willed and ambitious. There are people in this world who will deliberately use a daughter as a shield in battle. There are leaders in this world who will forcefully train 10-year-old boys to fire rifles and charge at an enemy. It can seem too horrible to imagine people acting this way, too hard to believe such acts could be real. Today we quickly discriminate between fiction and fact, mythology and history, religion and science as easily as we identify the differences between colors like yellow, red, and blue. But when it comes to things that move us, the things that guide our own actions, we shift between event and story, assumption and imagination, as the sailors who followed Agamemnon, gazing into what the writer Homer might have called a wine-dark sea. While you read this book, you can imagine that you hold your own daughter, the two figures of authority standing beside you act as cautionary symbols of just what is at stake, what motivated people are willing to do to reach their goals. From Actions to Observations On December 16, 2012, a bus driver, five men, and one teenage boy raped a woman in Minurka, a neighborhood of New Delhi. Jyoti Singh was a physiotherapy student enjoying a night out with her male friend. They were returning home after seeing the movie Life of Pi. He was beaten unconscious. She died in a hospital bed days later. India's courts found the driver and passengers guilty of rape and murder. India's courts sentenced the men to death and the minor to three years in a reform facility. Police records suggest stories like this can be quite common. A rape is reported on average every 18 hours in some neighborhoods of New Delhi. But something made this one event different, almost novel. Of over 700 rape cases reported in New Delhi in 2012, one became global news. What made this bit of news different? People paid attention to the story, horrified by the graphic violence, and felt compelled to do more than just let the case go. Citizens of India gathered in protest and outrage. It wasn't enough to let old ways continue. More than a billion people worldwide heard about the news story. Courts tried the accused and enforced sentences. Some people continued to work for further changes in the Indian culture and legal system. The attention of the global public moved on to other stories. What compelled these men to behave like this? What possessed them? And what compelled so many people to react and do something about this single violent event? Did all the attention put an end to the acts of rape? or the culture of shame in New Delhi, in Asia, or in any part of our world. When I first heard of Jyoti's story, 
I wondered what motivations could be behind such violent acts. Blame could be placed on the alcohol the men were drinking that night. But blaming a drink is about as satisfying today as claims of supernatural possession. Did Dionysus really make them do it? Blaming a hormone like testosterone can amount to hand-waving as well. Even if we say the whisperings of some demon cause such behavior, that explanation will no longer work with today's audience. Words may label things and ideas, but they don't resolve the motivations behind our actions. In Jyoti, we had a real and living daughter sacrificed to the motivations of others. The West came to know of Jyoti through the network of world media. Readers know of the daughters of Agamemnon and Jephthah from ancient texts. A story about two other men illustrate another moment of change in the development of the modern world. A Catholic priest in the late 1700s by the name of Johann Joseph Gassner earned a reputation as a formidable exorcist in the last part of his career. For much of his life, he suffered from despair, but at one point he experienced a kind of revelation, a personal apocalypse. As he worked on himself and his demons, he devised a method he could use with others as well. Gassner did not use the authoritative official exorcism rituals from the Catholic Church at the time. Instead, he would walk quietly into a room and invite a troubled soul to sit with him. He interviewed the person with a few questions. When he had a sense of the problem, he would begin the exorcism by asking, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the demon causing the problem to show itself in a display of symptoms. He often repeated this step several times. If no symptoms showed, Gasner reasoned the problem wasn't demonic. He would suggest the person see the local doctor for medical attention instead. If a symptom did appear, Gasner would take that as evidence the problem was demonic. He would then order the demon to be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. This was repeated until the symptoms were under control. After the initial session, Gasner trained his patient to call the demon and expel it using a similar process. Patients would use the same techniques and same script as the priest. According to Gasner, if the patients truly believed in Jesus Christ and truly believed in the power of words, they could calm themselves, manage their symptoms, and exercise their demons. They could possess some method of control rather than be possessed. Gasner's methods did not go unchallenged. A doctor by the name of Franz Mesmer studied the work of the priest and declared that, although Gasner was sincere in his beliefs and his intentions, his cures were better attributed to something other than religious power or supernatural superstition. Officially, Mesmer reported that Gasner's cures came from the priest's high degree of animal magnetism. Mesmer and Gasner stand as two very different authoritative fathers of a more modern era, one from a religious tradition and the other from a scientific tradition. Mesmer was a doctor and a student of magnetic forces. He applied magnetism to many medical treatments. He coined the term animal magnetism and theorized that magnetism influenced people's personalities and medical conditions. At one point, Mesmer even attempted to treat a young woman's blindness with magnetism. Though unsuccessful, he stuck to his theories and expanded his treatments. His name became a word used to describe the treatments. People would be mesmerized by the physician's presence. Mesmer's secular theorizing marked the end of Gassner's religious coaching with troubled individuals. It also marked a cultural shift in authority in the West. These two men stood at the emergence of psychology as both a subject of academic study and as an authoritative practice for helping people manage and regulate behaviors and motivations. Gassner, a Catholic priest, retired despite the documented effectiveness of the treatment and the humble restrictions he placed on the use of his methods. Mesmer, a doctor, believed his own innovative ideas had rather unlimited applications to health and wellness. He and his magnetic treatments became quite popular for a short while, though Mesmer's theories expired with the man. After his death, Mesmer's students looked at the data and abandoned the doctor's procedures. A new term, hypnosis, described the technique eventually drawn out of the work of Mesmer and his students. War and conquest and family make up the context for the stories we have of Agamemnon 
and Jephthah. They were men of action. The context for Gazner and Mesmer can be described as theory and practice and social relationships. They were individuals of observation. In Agamemnon and Jephthah, we have two figures willing to sacrifice their daughters to reach their goals. In comparison, Gazner and Mesmer pursued treatments for clients, such as young women, who were hoping to make sense of their lives and their worlds. Mesmer is an example of how novelty, not fully understood or authoritative, but appearing to be fresh and creative, can captivate us and hold us in awe. Time has judged Mesmer's methods to be not worthy of worship or practice, despite the attention and influence he once received. Mesmer had taken a bite from the proverbial fruit of knowledge and found a flavor that captivated his thinking. But those who came after abandoned his knowledge, his theories, and his methods.